Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome back to Inside Arsenal, where as you can see, I'm joined once again by James Benj of CBS, which means it is Inside Arsenal Extra Time. We're going a little bit early this week, James. It is Tuesday. Well, this is going out on Tuesday. We're actually recording it on Monday because I'm going to be flying through the air on my way to Portugal on Tuesday. So this is be a pre-recorded one, a bit early, but it's early because of a big reason, isn't it? Champions League knockout games are back for Arsenal. How exciting does that sound? Oh, it's brilliant. Look, look, the sun is shining where we are. The blossom is out on my trees. It feels like spring has sprung and Arsenal are in the uh, Arsenal are back in the Champions League knockout round. And for the first time in a long time, that isn't news to bring a terrified gasp of sort of panic. We might actually not lose this one 5-1. That would be nice. That would be nice. I'm looking at my weather app on my phone right now and Don't. tomorrow we have got just sunshine in Porto, going up to 20 degrees. Unfortunately, I'm going to arrive there about four o'clock and I'm literally going to have to go straight from the airport, I think, to the press conference at the Drag Hour. So I don't think I'm going to get to see much sunshine. And then Wednesday's cloudy and then Thursday's rain. So uh, it's not exactly dream Portuguese weather, but it's uh, it's it's not looking too bad. And yeah, it's just I've nice never been. It's supposed to be a brilliant city, though. So I hope you get a bit of time on Wednesday to explore. Yeah, I know. I say I've never been. I've dri- I've flown into Porto Airport, and when I had to do a Reading pre-season tour, and they were <laughs> staying at a place kind of called it was just outside a little te- like medieval town called Obidos. It was a brilliant trip actually. Um, and I flew into Porto and picked up a high car there, and then drove down to where Reading were based for their for their pre-season tour. So that's that's the extent of my Porto knowledge. But if it's anything like Lisbon, then uh, it should be a really really good trip. Very jealous. I'll be That's a great I remember I was going to Lisbon for the one under Emery when Welbeck scored the winner. It was on that like 10 game winning run as part of the 20 match unbeaten run of Emery. And um, yeah, that was a blinding trip. I really like that. My last European away day, because Goal uh, decided to pull <laughs> pull the funding for uh, for away trips. My last European away day was Olympiakos. You know, just before COVID hit, the first thing. Yeah. Back then. Um, and uh, yeah, that was last. Uh, I think I actually started this YouTube channel the day before the second leg of that um, Olympiacos game. Because I was away then, sitting down having breakfast with Sam Dean at the Telegraph in um, in Athens on the morning of the game. And he said to me, you know what, you should start a YouTube channel. Because um, I've been thinking about it for a while. And he was like, mm. you should start a YouTube channel. I think you've got the following. I think it could do well. I was like, yeah, I might do, might do. I, then, I just re- just remind you here that we were very insistent this time that we wouldn't do our usual sort of hour and 10 minute long Genesis style jazz funk odyssey of a podcast. And we were going to keep this one tight. tight. So well, uh, it, it, enough it of your reminiscences. People want to talk about Burnley. It wouldn't be inside Arsenal extra time it's if we didn't true. just start waffling away about stuff that people probably didn't care too much about. So, uh, yeah, you're right. You're right to call me up on it. You're right to call me up on it. Let's talk about Burnley quickly. We're not going to spend too much time talking about Burnley, though, because that is in the past. And, of course, I think today's show has got to be more about the future and that big, big Champions League game. But, look, it was brilliant. I know you you weren't there. You were at, um, you were at Brentford-Liverpool, weren't you, in the, the morning yeah. game, weren't you? Yeah. So you saw that Premier League's top two now. We both saw them on Saturday. I was watching the Liverpool game in the um, in the press room up at Turf Moor. And I did wonder, after seeing that result, because it was one of those games where you think, that's a tricky one, Liverpool could drop points there. And then when I saw they won like that, it did suck the, sap the life out of me a little bit. I was just like mm. sitting there in the press room, like, oh. And I, and I thought to myself, I wonder if Arsenal players are kind of feeling like that, having seen what Liverpool have just done. But they certainly, if they were, they certainly didn't show it with that performance because they were, they were brilliant from the start, early goal. From Odegaard and um and yeah they were great. I and mean, you've seen the highlights of it, haven't you? What did you think of what you saw? Oh, absolutely sensational! Yeah, this is a, a team that I, I I'm sure you are right that they knew what Liverpool had done, and I I I think they would have because I did, and I think many people did thought that Liverpool might drop some points here, and I think I'm mm. sure they were thinking the same about City, and those can be the games that then really sap it out of you. Burnley have been kind of better than. Saturday's result would suggest, and they'd given Liverpool a hard game on the road. So, kind of as I left, um, actually, I mean, the, the Erdegaard goal went in as Jurgen Klopp was speaking, but this is sort of as I let's it, let's imagine it was as I left the G Tech Community Stadium. I was sort of thinking, oh, this could be a rough one for Arsenal. This this could be a bad weekend, 
and they just immediately nullify any of those concerns, don't they? When this team gets out in front, I don't. It's been a long time since I've seen any reason to panic. Arsenal's problems, even back last season, were not about hold. Always not always about holding leads, mm-hmm. and this team as well. They just they seem to have that desire once they get one to get five or six, not seven though. And it's Art was telling me last week, Art de Roche. It's been much too long since Arsenal have scored seven goals, and I do agree with him there. So if you're watching, Mikel, there you go. When was the last time Arsenal scored seven? I'm trying to think was it... one of the one of the Prague teams. We yeah, think. they beat Prague seven. Yeah, I remember that was a brilliant game. Uh, so I remember Cesc scoring That's... absolute beauty in that match. They beat well, Newcastle okay. they, when, when Walcott scored that hat trick. That was proper, seven. We agreed, not proper seven. If you know, you need it needs to be like a seven nil, seven uh, one, seven three. Like that's that was a nervy seven goaler somehow. I mean, that that's our late Wenger Arsenal for you, isn't it? Scoring seven goals and still being worried. So I don't know why, but I wasn't at the Emirates for that game. I think maybe I was working, and because it was a night it's game, like, it was five thirty, was it? I, I might be yeah, working. just after Christmas. It might have been when I was covering. Um, one of my sort of non-league teams that I used to cover back in my uh, local ju- newspaper days. And I went down the pub watching that game. I just remember it being a really great day because Arsenal won seven and I had Walcott as my fantasy league captain <laughs> and I and I had Giroud who came off the bench and scored twice. And it was like, it was just brilliant. I was just sitting there racking the points up um, while enjoying a few pints. So it, was a, yeah, it was a good game. It was a good game. Yeah, I mean, I know Arsenal were ruthless against Burnley. They were, they were really, really good. Um, I really enjoyed watching that. Like you, I, I just wasn't sure what to expect after what happened against Liverpool. You know, would that have any sort of impact? As soon as Martin Odegaard drilled in that go- that goal, it was a, it was just, you know, it was a, a case of how many goals Arsenal are going to get. And it's, it's nice to be, you think back, you know, not for, long ago now, basically before the trip to Dubai and the, the kind of struggles of scoring goals, the struggles of creating chances, the, the poor shot conversion rate when they did generate those chances. And that's just all flipped on its head so quickly and so dramatically. Arsenal got the best goal difference in the league now. Second best scorers, I think. Third, now that City scored one. I mean, whatever the tally is, it's it's pretty fantastic. And, you know, all those concerns we had about is that any Arsenal player going to get into double figures? Well, Bakayo Saka, I think, is now only two short of last season's goal tally as well. He's on 12 in the league now, Saka. And, I mean, he's, he's... he could get close to a 20 goal Premier League season now, which is, um, you know, it'd be even remarkable. I think the brilliant thing about Saka, and um, I was reading, like, a lot of my colleagues have done a, the preview stuff for Porto, and everywhere I sort of read, it's like man of the match picks Saka, first scorer picks Saka. And I agree with all of it. And I'm like, but you know, the thing is, until a few weeks ago, I think if most people would have sort of rated his season as like a, Seven out of ten, like it feels like there is so much room for Saka, but even based on the standards he set in past seasons, that he's now sort of accelerating into at just the right moment. Um, I mean, I don't want to give the Rio Ferdinand nonsense too much airtime because it's stupid. Uh, because you know, everyone has their own measure of what world class is, but if anyone's measure of world class doesn't include Bukayo Saka. They need to look at their measures again because this guy is phenomenal. He's a mm. killer and he keeps improving. That right footed goal, he didn't score that one last season. Oh, well, I've got to pull you up on that. I think he does score that one. I think he did score that well, goal last season. But I, I think he, or maybe the season before, but but whenever you kind of want to say that, you know, he he's he's always been a bit of a two footed player, but I th- mm. I think he's he's kind of built new ways of scoring from that position. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say I'd say that's only from last season. I remember we scored his goal at Ellen Road in the one 0 win. Ellen Road was like that; it was right footed, top corner. He scored it against Everton as well later on in the season. It's be, it's becoming a little bit of a thing for him. I think it's that classic. If you're a left winger, I suppose everyone, every fullback is told put him out on his right, put him out on his right. And if that keeps happening, you've got to work out, you've got to work away of actually being able to take advantage of that. And and I think that kind of sums up how good a player he is. He is now able to do that and he's worked on that and um yeah he, he he was brilliant looking at the league table um yeah i mean goal difference wise arsenal now five ahead of man city and goal difference i city having played a game less of course but after united win at luton yesterday that is the top six if you're watching on youtube you can see it so it's liverpool 57 arsenal 55 city 53 villa 49 good win for them at fulham spurs of course lost against wolves mm-hmm. at home 47 then united 44. Um, so that's the top six. 
certainly looking i mean it's exciting isn't it you just look at that it, it's just got a hell of a running written all over it hasn't it? it it really really does um just on united's game against luton yes i saw you tweet when sambi did that tackle um because i didn't watch the game i've watched the highlights but i was at my mother-in-law's yesterday and i was watching and i was sort of following on on um twitter and i saw your tweet and everyone else suddenly just like sambi that is incredible what a clearance mm. i've gone back and looked at it it's brilliant fair play to him not the only great thing he did yeah, well, he was man of the match. He was well, he was voted Luton's man of the match anyway. Um, uh, after the game, and uh, as you can see, we've got plenty of people who have got in touch. And I did think we, I think we did talk about Sambi last week, didn't we? But a lot of people have got in touch on the back of that game against Luton, um, against United yesterday, asking about Sambi and what to do ne- next season with him. I think we both sort of agreed last week when we spoke about it that it still makes sense to sell him and it's probably Arsenal probably moved on from Sambi and for him it's probably a good idea to move on as well but is there anything you're seeing or saw yesterday when you watched him and watched him pretty closely that made you think you know what maybe he's worth coming back and and um uh, having a chance I mean so we've got Josh Mike and uh and I'd, I'm not sure how you pronounce that top one um but all getting in touch talking about him so what are your thoughts on it yeah I mean I I still am of the view of of selling and I think the good news about this this form is fine because the United game was absolutely not a one-off by all accounts. The good news about it is a lot of other Premier League clubs or Luton, if they stay up, will will look at this guy and go, okay, we know he can cut it in the Premier League. Mm. And, you know, let's, let's look at giving Arsenal good money for him. And I think that's really encouraging. I think one of the things I like about the way he plays, even at Luton, he's such a technically assured player that I, I don't think a, a top European club would go, oh, you know, he's only doing this at Luton. There's no point in us looking at him. So I I think the the way I generally view it is this is all just about expanding the market, increasing the value for Sambi Lakonga. And that can sometimes be as good a loan decision as any other you make, you know, as mm-hmm. good as Emile Smith Rowe to Huddersfield or any other one, Jack Wilshire at Bolton, you know, where it was all about getting them ready for the first team. But you know, you do have uh, one sort of six whose fitness you probably can't trust going into next season, who you might find it hard to sell. Uh, and then you have Jorginho. I'm just, I, I wouldn't now feel like it would be an, a mad idea to bring Lukonga in as like a, like a third DM. I think there have to be very specific circumstances. I, there's not the money to strengthen that position in the squad you can't move out Partey but he has like you're really very very worried about his injury issues you know if he came in as a sort of El Nene level thing for Lakonga that would be brilliant and I think he'd be an upgrade on El Nene mm. I don't particularly think you're serving Lakonga well in his career then and I think as a long-term move you're lopping several million off what the fee you will eventually get then because I don't ever see a world where Sambi is the the starting midfielder for Arsenal as they compete for the title. So I think in that view, with that being the case, and I'm I'm sure you agree, the thing is you sell him when you can get the most money for him, and that's probably this summer. Yeah, I th- I, I agree. I think that's the case. If you don't if you don't sell him this summer, I don't see his value ever being higher than it's going to be after a season playing in the Premier League, playing well. It's very similar to. Um, uh, oh my God! How on earth have I, has his name suddenly gone out of my head? Uh, Allegan. Yes, Balogun, Florian Balogun. Oh my god! Well, to be fair, it's quite easy to know why he isn't scoring goals anymore. Well, he's not having a good season, no. And, and exactly, last season, after that year he had in France with Rims, it was, you know, his value was not going to be higher, especially given his contract situation. It was never going to be higher than what it was last se- season. And Arsenal had to react to that and sell and get good money, and move on. And I just feel with Sambi as well, if he carries on between now and the end of the season playing like this for Luton. You know, his value is never going to be higher. If he comes back to Arsenal and ends up being kind of the on any replacement in this in the squad, then you get a year down the line, and you're just not you're going to be where you were last year mm. at the end of last season, aren't you? And you just can't really sell. And so, yeah, I think it makes sense as as well as he's playing, and it's great to see him playing well. Um, I do feel that it was still all points towards a, a summer sale uh, when it comes to kind of when it comes to Sambi. Right, you mentioned Jorginho in that last discussion. Um, let's move. On to Porto now. That is obviously the big talking point of the week. And I'm really interested in what Mikel's going to do with the team selection against Porto. He's gone unchanged for the last two games. I wasn't surprised mm. at all he was unchanged at Burnley. I thought I thought that would be the case. Um, 
I thought maybe if Tommy was fit, he would come in at left back. I don't think now that Tommy should come in at left back anyway, to be honest. I think it would be really unfair on Kivior to take him out of the team. I think he's playing really, really well. I thought he was excellent again at Burnley. And I think he deserves to keep his place in the team. Um, what do, what can you envisage Mikel doing? Because there is three games in seven days this week. It was obviously Burnley, which was a bit of a breeze. And again, Mikel was able to, you know, a triple substitution as soon as the fourth goal went in. Saka off, Rice off, White off. Again, just similar as what happened against West Ham. And that's really good because you've been able to, you know, basically have 60 minutes worth of work in their legs. But they do then have a trip to Portugal, the game on Wednesday night, the travel back to England, and then Newcastle on Saturday night, which is going to be a high-intensity game, 100%. So <coughs> how do you reckon Mikel's going to approach this week or these next two games? I think Jorginho will start one of the two. I think, I think here is on Wednesday. Yeah, this is where I thought you and I might diverge because I know you're very, and you're rightly of the view that you cannot take any European away night for granted. And, you know, like we've said before, Arsenal, round of 16, they've got, you know, even though it was very different squads, they've got some work to do to just prove they can win games. I I don't regularly watch the Portuguese league, but I do know that Porto are, are quite a way back in third. They've been beaten by Aruca. They're an upper mid-table team. They drew against Rio Ave. They're not a team. I mean, I don't. I mean, Newcastle haven't exactly been great of late. I've been pulling up any trees, but I, I don't think they're a team that necessarily necessitates starting Jorginho. Whereas I remember how brilliant he was again at St James's Park last season. So I. I sort of shade towards keeping something like something like the same team on Wednesday that started on Saturday and making a few, you know, bringing in a Jorginho for uh, for Saturday's game. But, you know, like we always say now, I remember when we used to uh, get a lot more incandescent about Mikel Arteta's team selection and he still surprises us. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm pretty comfortable that he'll he knows what he's doing. That's for sure. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think just because it's, obviously it's not a one-off game, it's a two-leg game and it's a way you want to make sure you don't do anything stupid in the second in the first leg. So, you know, the game is yeah. still very much in your grasp going back to the Emirates. I just feel like, and the way that the Champions League is and the way the game is going to pan out, you know, it's not going to be as fast and frenetic as the Premier League game, I don't think. I just think it kind of suits Jorginho coming in and almost um, playing. I, I have put, I mean, I'm not sure where it is. Give me one sec, but... Um, I have put my predicted 11 together for this game. And I've gone with that kind of Jorginho and Rice double. And I've taken Martinelli out the side. I'm sticking with Trossard. I'm playing Trossard on the left, Saka right, Odegaard is the 10, Havertz up top, and then Jorginho mm. and Rice the pair. Kind of like we saw against Liverpool, wasn't it? Although Martinelli started that game, not Trossard. Trossard came on. Um I mean, I'm just obviously it's just purely guess guesswork, but I wouldn't be surprised if he if he sort of heads down this route a little bit more for the Champions League and then he reverts to type of what we've seen recently against Newcastle on Saturday. I just think Jorginho might be a really important piece in the Champions League this season. Um, The other thing we we could sort of allude to as well is, I mean, you and I have have mentioned this name and, and been given good reason to believe he will be fit and then looked a bit foolish in the days after, but from what I hear, Thomas Partey progressing really well in his recovery. Now, I wouldn't think he'd be able to start against Newcastle or Porto, but how would his potential availability, certainly for the second of those two games, how, if at all, would that come into Arteta's thinking? Is it easy to start Jorginho for two games if you know that at the moment for that Newcastle game, Partey would be able to come and give you half an hour off the bench? Mm. I mean, that, that, that this could be something, it could be nothing. I look at your team and the, I, I do know what you mean. Like The worst thing you can do is give yourself a mountain to climb at the Emirates. But the, equally, the best thing you could do, I think, is to, to win the tie in the first round. And I think Arsenal are capable of doing that. So I would just roll out, not least because I'm really liking things like seeing Ben White inverting. And I, I kind of look at that back four and think, well, is the, what's how does all the spacing look with Jorginho and Rice next to them? Maybe Rice goes further forward. Um, I would go with the eleven that that's won the last two games mm-hmm. um, and, and keep that rolling because it's it's a pretty special uh, thing he stumbled upon so far. Well, not stumbled. yeah, 
Yeah, no, I, I agree on that. I think momentum is obviously a massive thing in football and Arsenal have that momentum now. But I just, we are going to have to, I don't, I, don't, I don't think you can just carry on playing the same team, can yeah. you? It, there's definitely going to have to be changes now. He's going to have to factor it in, whether that be on Wednesday night or certainly on Saturday. Um, there's just no room for well, error. I mean, actually, that, that, yeah, that team might be the, the, the team of the last two games now I think about it as well. might be really well suited for an opponent like Newcastle where, you know, you're not going to give Botman and Cher, these two big, strong defenders, don't give them a reference point. Don't give them a, a centre forward that's going to play with their, his backs to goal. And the Trossard, Trossard Havertz combo works really well there for robbing those teams and for filling midfield. And Newcastle's midfield really is an area that, that Arsenal can dominate in a way that they, they couldn't a few months ago or even last season when they won. So, I mean, this is this is the joy of Arsenal playing as good as they are, is when you think about how they might line up, it's all just interesting, fun options, isn't it? It's not like, mm. God, where's the next goal coming from? Where's the next clean sheet coming from? It's sort of, how do we pick at the holes that we think, or that our, and that Arteta will think, might emerge in these games? What great options to have when you still don't have, when you still have that quartet of players that we all know who aren't available. I mean, imagine how good it will be then. Well, exactly. It's like um, I teed you up. It's like you, I teed you, you up did. for that. You did. I mean, Gabriel Jesus, I spoke about Gabriel Jesus on my show yesterday and talked about how big a decision that's facing Mikel when it comes to Jesus, really, when he is fully fit. Now, we don't know if he's fully fit. By the time people are watching this, because it's going out on Tuesday, obviously, open training may well have even happened by the time people are watching it. So we're going to have a much clearer picture in terms of who are training. Because I think a few players who didn't travel to Burnley at the weekend, I think they were training last week anyway. Mm. Um, and they were held back probably because of what's to come this week. And they're just like, you know what, we're, just, we're going to carry on just getting some work into them in the training ground before bringing them back into the team. I don't know if Jesus was one of them. I'm pretty sure Party was one of them. Um, and... Yeah, Jesus is a really interesting one because, you know, he was he is Arsenal's number nine. He's the main striker. But suddenly now, Arsenal have found this new form. We've found this formation that is working so, so well with Trossard at the top of it and Havertz behind and the pair of them sort of switching over and combining. And you know, Jay, um, Saka and Martinelli are thriving off the space that seems to be generated. And Arsenal are just a horrible team to defend against at the moment because of the movement and the, the connections that everyone seems to have. And so, you know, it seems mad to suggest that Jesus isn't going to come back into this team, but it's, you know, it, 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 there's, the op, there's a possibility that we saw last season when Jesus did return mm. to fitness and came back into the team. It disrupted things a little bit, didn't it? Because they'd been playing so well with Trossard in that nine position again. And then Jesus returned to fitness and he did come back into the team and we saw less of Trossard in Arsenal's results did suffer as a result I and mean, maybe not i mean they mm. certainly dropped off at that time and so maybe it was coincidental maybe not maybe it would have happened anyway but when you sort of put the two things together you could see where the drop-off came in terms of results and so it's an interesting what Mikko was going to do with gabby <laughs> yeah i one we all know because he's one of the few players that you can ask arteta about and he'll always give you a good quote and not try and talk about the squad but but two i just don't see anything that trossard even at this level does that the uh, the the best version of jesus doesn't do better you know i mean trossard is is a fantastic false nine right now for arsenal but jesus at full form and fitness and that's why i don't think he will be rushed back because you know that will take time to come that jesus does all of those things better gets more shots gets more of everything and does he get more goals though adds chaos he Does can he do. He can. I, I just don't believe that there is anything about Jesus that means he can't score. I just think there's been a bit of a barren run. All of the all of these injuries to do with that knee. I think that the way I would view this is is that Trossard has allowed Arteta to not rush when it comes to uh, getting Jesus back in the team. But I think the minute Jesus is ready to go. Arteta will be ramping him up. May not come in from the very outset because Arteta likes to reward players that are playing well and, and doesn't think any minutes should be earned. I mean, like you say, 
when he came back last season, it wasn't just Trossard that was ahead of him. There were certainly moments where it looked like Nketiah was ahead of him in the pecking order. But I would be shocked if come, what, where are we now? I, you know, late March, by the run-in, I, I think you will see a system very similar to what we're playing at the moment with Jesus in the eleven and and Trossard out. But yeah, I think the good Trossard thing is might say this good. The good thing is that Trossard is playing so well that, like you said, there is no need to rush anything with Jesus at all. You do not have to get him in the team and see him basically catch up with his fitness and match sharpness at a time when you know you're, you're basically pl trying to play him into form, and that could really have an imp a negative impact on Arsenal. So you can take your time with him. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Like I say, it's a really big decision that Mikel's going to have to going to have to face. I do tend to agree with you that I think he'll probably, if Jesus can get fully fit, that you know he will he will come in for the big big games. Um, but I certainly wouldn't rush him. You know, I think Trossard's playing so well, and I think Trossard's such a good player. And I do think that Trossard's a better finisher. I think he'd score more goals. Than <laughs> Um, but if the rest of the team are scoring as many as they're scoring at the moment, maybe that's not such a big thing with, with the nine. But we'll see. I mean, lots of people are going to touch on Jesus. See, Joel here says, um, uh, unpopular opinion, but considering how the team is currently gelling, I don't see how Jesus is essential. And given his main job, we seem to overlook his lack of goal scoring and bask in his incredibly good vision of footwork. I think we've seen on occasions why he wasn't a guaranteed starter at City even before Haaland joined. Gary says, do you also feel like... Um, do you also feel like Trossard's performances now mean Jesus will have to earn his way back into the nine role when he's fit? And if so, what sort of drop off in performance would need to see from Trossard? And that Nicola at the bottom there says, not really a question, but rather an opinion. Jesus has to earn his place back from the bench and shouldn't walk back into a starting 11. He could be a really useful substitute. See, I agree with that. I think he does need to earn his place back. I think mm. you can't just suddenly drag Trossard out of the team just because Jesus is fit. I think he needs to earn his place back. He needs to show when he comes back that he is fit. That, um, that he looks sharp, maybe gets himself a couple of goals or has some big moments. But I, I think it's also important to remember that basically his last game that Jesus played, Arsenal won 2 1. He scored one, set up one, and was man of the match, which, you know, again shows how, how good a footballer he is. But, but yeah, what are your thoughts? He has to earn his place back? Yeah, but absolutely. Um, I just think he will. I, I know it's, and I know that right now a lot of Arsenal fans are very frustrated but with Jesus. I mean, He's not even on 1,100 Premier League minutes. And by the way, if I told you that Jesus would have been playing less than half of the available minutes for Arsenal so far this season, uh, you would probably not have believed it, me if I then said that Arsenal would be firmly in the title race and one of the favourites for the Champions League. I'd, I, I, I think, it, it, like, 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 like I just said, it's about getting him really over this knee issue because you know Arsenal won't confirm this but when you look at the the injuries he's had it's hard to believe that it isn't just about this this knee playing up time and time again that's what all the issues are so take time and and actually I I think that's what they're doing and what they've been doing over the last few weeks I think people often think of it as setbacks Arteta said didn't he after West Ham he said Jesus was going to be away for days I think he was even after Liverpool, wasn't it? Mm. I think to an extent, all they're doing is just playing it a bit safe. And I think when you play it safe with Jesus and he's back at full form, we forget what that player was like against Leicester, against United early in those um, early in those first two seasons. He's such a talent. He gets in good positions more than Trossard does. He may, I, I agree with you, he's not as good a finisher, but also I'm like, you know, I look at that XG data, I look at how long he's underperformed it, and I just think one day, <laughs> one day he's going to overperform it all. And that's the time when Arsenal will be very glad to have Jesus. He does have an incredible record in the Champions League, to be he fair, does. where he, he might have struggled for goals in the Premier League, but for City, his Champions League record was outstanding. And he's, you know, so far for Arsenal, his, his champion, I think he's scored in every game almost for Arsenal so far mm. in group stages, albeit against let's face it, Europa League opposition pretty much, but he still scored and took him away and played really, really well. You think back to that severe away game again when he got injured annoyingly, but what he did before he went off injured in that game is just the assist for Martinelli, the goal that he scored. Um, yeah, I think it, it is easy when the player's been out for a while and you do, you do get frustrated about his injuries. It is, it is easy to forget about just how good a player they actually are though. And um, yeah, I'm certainly not ready to, to write Gabriel Jesus uh off yet so where is there anyone else any other sort of surprises you could think could possibly happen 
in the game on Porto. I'm, I'm sort of trying to think of it now. I can't. I can't really think. It's obviously what he does up front. Would it be Martinelli or Trossard on the left if Havertz plays up front? And you, you need to do. I, I can't really think of any other thing he's really going to have to. He's going to struggle with his team selection. The only other thing would be whether someone returns nice and early. You know, Tommy Asu was supposed to be a niggle. Like you say, is he one of those those ones? I don't think. I don't think Zinchenko will be back, and certainly not Partey. And you wouldn't start him. So, but again, if Tommy Asu comes back, I think Arsenal have found such a nice little rhythm with Kivior. And credit to all three of them because. Saliba moving out really, really, really wide, like he was. You know, I saw some clips from Burnley because um, I don't watch like the highlights to see the chances. I watch it to see the funny, weird tactical things. Gabriel moving into the centre, all that stuff means I don't think there's any point in rushing back Tommy Asu either, and I don't think Arteta would see it. So, changing. I mean, beyond like you say, a couple, a couple of tailored moves. I think the back four probably stays stays as it is. Everyone, no one's even talking about whether Aaron Ramsdale might start, but I think that's just because David Raya looks great. Yeah, well, Ramsdale's not going to start, is he? He's, there's no chance. Raya's definitely going to be in goal. Raya was in goal for the group stages, wasn't he? Until the until yeah. the job was done and dusted, so it's there's true. no way he's going to suddenly bring Ramsdale in for the for the knockout stage. He's been brilliant, Raya, as well since the turn of the year. I mean, he's not, only faced one shot on target in the last no, two shots on target in the last three games. So he's not exactly been overworked, but he's what he's doing with the ball when he gets it. Um, he just looks really the crosses, man. The crosses. He's just on it. He's just really on it. He just looks calm. You know, th- those sort of early nerves when he first came into the team seem to have gone. And I feel like the players around him are really sort of understanding him a lot more now. And the movement as soon as he gets the ball with Martinelli and people like that, you know, I think they're just expecting it to come really, really quickly to them and they're beginning to understand him. Um, yeah, so I think he's looking he's looking very good. Like I said, I think Kivior's been so good in the last few games. I think he deserves to keep his place in the team, even if Tommy Asu is fit, to be honest. Here's um, one from uh, Devon who says, uh, great time to be an Arsenal fan, uh, but Arteta's record in European knockout stages makes me worried about the Porto game. We will need a Rice-Jorginho central midfield pairing again. So he's agreeing with me on that one. He's going Raya, White, Saliba, Gabriel, Kivior, Rice-Jorginho, Odegaard, Saka, Havertz and Martinelli. So no Trossard in the team. Uh, for Devan. I mean, he, he mentioned there Arteta's record in European knockout stages. It's not great. That's Ooh. putting it nicely. I think he got to the semi-final when he lost to Emery, didn't he, in the COVID season? Yeah. But then there's been some really disappointing defeats. The Olympiacos at home sport in Lisbon last season. So he does have um, a few sort of questions he needs to answer in terms of how he progresses through these knockout stages in European competition. I think it's a big, it's a big night for him. I think some of those, though, are sort of the glorious nonsense of European knockout football. I mean, especially in the Europa League, where deep down you don't give a you don't give a monkeys until you know if you're in the Europa League until the semi-finals, maybe until it becomes more likely that you get to the Champions League that way than through the league. Um, you know, the sporting game was the ultimate sort of collision of freak circumstances: mm. Saliba injury, Tommy Asso injury. Um, Pedro Gonçalves or whoever it was just doing a naive what just a to goal disrespect that Arsenal. Was. What a goal that was. I mean, and actually somehow that is sort of put into the shade by uh, the Olympiacos super spreader event um, yeah. where, I mean, and that was all a problem of away, the away goals rule, wasn't it? You know, in, in years gone by. Well, the Aubameyang I mean, missed. Remember the Aubameyang, the Aubameyang missed, missed yeah. the game? I mean, Unbelievable. The... <laughs> I mean, that's the the sort of worry. If we'd been kind of, if the Champions League had started at the start of January, started again, I'd be quite worried about, you know, Arsenal are so cautious defensively. They're only one of those, um, you know, the Saliba, Ryan mistake, whoever you want to blame from Liverpool. They're only one of them away from being in real trouble. But I think now that Arsenal are sort of moving through the gears offensively, I just look at this and say, best defence in Europe, really good attack um that's actually you know it's a great great recipe and a lot of the rest maybe some random stuff happens but i think the reason he's not had a great knockout record is that arsenal haven't been a great team and that sometimes gets reflected in knockouts even more yeah they're certainly a much better team now going into this and they they have been in any other time even then i I even count last season into that i just think they look like a proper team Mm. now um certainly they're just they 
Yeah, they just look ready to do something very, very special, I think. And um, the fact they've got so many key players to come back into it as well, it's going to be a, it's going to be a really, really exciting end to the season. Um, a, a couple of questions to end this off. Hampstead Owl here is talking about Mbappe. Um, what did you make, first of all, before I get into the question, <laughs> what did you make of Mikel's comments about Mbappe? I, I was really surprised the route he went down with that. I, was, I, was, I just fully expected him to do the old, I'm not talking about a player that's not mm. you know, contracted to Arsenal stuff because I knew he was obviously going to get asked about it because it's such a giant giant story but I was I was surprised the route you went down with his answers what did you think of it I I felt like he would have done the I'm not talking about this if he thought there was a chance uh hate to be that guy yeah yeah well, um, there's not a chance. I mean, we all know there's, yeah, not a chance. there's no chance <laughs> do, you well, reckon was, a... do you reckon it was a bit of a message to the owners eh? that's what I I kind of came away from it thinking was yeah. it a bit of a look I know we're not going to sign Mbappe but we need to be, if we want to really move up to the next sort of level and, you know, consistently compete for the top honours and go against City, you know, machines like City all the time, we do need to be in the conversation for these type of players when they're available. It just felt like, if, and it was just, you know, there's no knowledge of it, inside knowledge of it. I just felt like he was, he he wanted that sort of public message to go out there. Mm. And you've got to remember that he has got contract talks sort of coming very, very soon, you would imagine, yeah. Mikel Arteta. and. If he wants to sort of look at how the next four or five years are going to pan out at Arsenal, he's going to be, you know, how much he wants to win. He's going to be want want to be in the conversation for players like this. And I think there's this, but there is one specific thing on Mbappe. Like we both just said it instinctively, he's not going there, and we think that, and we will almost certainly be right. But I'm sure Arteta's aware as aware of it as anyone that like something could just not happen for Madrid, couldn't it? You know, they could. By all accounts, sort of the word coming out of the Spanish press is like, look, we're not matching the money you were on at PSG. Um, and obviously there's all the Ill, Ill feeling, isn't there, about the times you turn them down. And I think what all, Mbappe, all Arteta would be saying is, you know, and I mean, he almost literally said it is to Arteta, and to Edu and the owners, is just just make sure you've made the call just in case. Yeah. Because he's going to be a free agent. And he, I would think if he doesn't go to Madrid, if that falls apart, I bet he goes back to PSG, cup in hand. But you want to make sure you're positioned, don't you? So that you've made the call so that Mbappe knows, Mbappe's people know who to call. If, yeah, okay. if, 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 and then you can have the conversation about salary and realise it won't work. I mean, Hampstead Al here talks about it and he says, since Arteta has put the idea back on the table, I think the point of whether he would be a good fit ought to be considered. It seems to me that the key strength for the current side is that it contains top quality players who are also committed to playing for each other with huge collegiate spirit. A prima donna type, this might be unfair to him, with wages four to five times the team norm could so easily risk upsetting that spirit, creating all sorts of problems that outweigh his goal-scoring potential. It seems to me that much of the rationale is about strengthening the Arsenal brand, extra commercial potential, etc. That could be a short-sighted way of looking at it, in my view. Um, and I, I fully get what, you, what you're getting out there, Hampstead Out. I have to say, though, when you're talking about killing Mbappe, if there is a chance to sign Kylian Mbappe, I think you put all of those... You, those things have to be considered that you mentioned, but... There, there comes a time when a player is that good, and that um, special. I think that you sign him, and uh, yeah, and I, you can't turn down Kylian Mbappe if the chance is there to sign him. Surely, I, I would obviously go above the wage structure, but I wouldn't obliterate it, like because it will. Oh, no, you're not going to give him a million pounds a week or something. Are you? Okay, what about what about five hundred grand a week? Is that too much? I don't know. I know we're getting in the weeds. I, I suppose it. You got to look into the future, don't you, and think, well, what's what's mm. he? Is he gonna is he gonna be the man who wins Arsenal three Premier Leagues and two Champions Leagues and sort of leads the dynasty type here at the club? Who knows? It's mm. all hypothetical, isn't it? But and I think the, the if Mesut Ozil was, if Mesut Ozil was worth three hundred and fifty grand a week, I I would be paying. I would have no issue paying Kylian Mbappe five hundred grand a week. And that's not me having a dig at Mesut Ozil. I think he's a great player and I loved Ozil at Arsenal. But it's only one hundred and fifty grand more. It's only you know. Almost a Cedric Suarez more on top of <laughs> <laughs> on top of Meza Ozil. And you probably are getting to... more production than Ozil and Cedric combined. And uh, the commercial benefits and everything like that that people yeah. talk about there would be huge if uh, for Arsenal to sign. The one, him. the one thing I'd say, I don't, I don't know enough to whether I could agree with the sort of prima donna description. And obviously, as Hampstead Al is using that, he's sort, sort of acknowledging he doesn't either. If, 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 if Kylian Mbappe turns up. The player I would want is not the player that plays at PSG 
most games where it just it, it, there's a sort of hanging around waiting for the defending to be done like you know again if 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 i, I do need to know that mbappe's going to give me the off ball work an off ball work level comparable to a jesus and a trossard I think we do underappreciate how like hard it becomes as a team to carry one player mm. defensively who doesn't do his work. And the thing that's going to intri- would intrigue me if Mbappe came to the Premier League is would that matter at all? Like with Haaland, he's not particularly diligent off the ball, and it doesn't matter. I don't know. I, I mean, like, look, none of this is me saying you, if the opportunity came up, Arsenal shouldn't do it. I just, those are my caveats. I, I want to know what he's going to be like off the ball. And I don't want to pay him so much money that it, it becomes a De Gea and a United situation where I'm then paying, you know, my fringe squad players 300 grand a week. Mm. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I don't I, think I, I would do it now. I've spoken like that. I, know, maybe I, I, get, I get what everyone, I get, I get what you're saying, but I don't think you could be turning down Bappe. And I think also if he doesn't press like a Martinelli, say, if he scores 30 goals a season, I think you can just about <laughs> um, But But anyway, yeah, I mean, it's a nice conversation to be had, but we all know it's not going to happen anyway. Um, just quickly, a couple of here from Anne and from, is that Prad? I'm not sure how you how you pronounce that one. Sorry, mate. Praddy, Praddy, I think. There you go. Um, both talking about Ramsdale, both talking about, talking about the goalkeeper situation. And says, goalkeeper next season, if Ramsdale is sold as expected, what are your thoughts on getting a quality number two player in this position? Who would be available or interested in joining Arsenal? Uh, similar at the bottom there says, um, what do you think about the second goalkeeper slot? Ramsdale was almost certainly leaving. Surely we are not relying on Hain. I like the look of James Trafford. I mean, look, James Trafford went £20 million pounds to Burnley. So I think that's, uh, that's off the off the agenda. I mean, it is something Arsenal are going to have to do. It's going to have to be factored into the summer business in, in the summer, isn't it? You know, Ramsdale is going to move on. I think we'd all be very surprised if he's still at Arsenal next season. So you are going to need top quality cover. And I don't think um, that, you know, Hine or James Hilson or someone like that is going to do the job. So Arsenal are going to have to bring in someone. It's not going to be someone who's going to cost £20 million, though, is it? I don't, I don't mm. think it will go back to the sort of Ramsdale, Turner sort of gap in, gap in quality, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I had I had one I had one name in mind because oh, I was yeah. I'd sort of been thinking about this for a while. Um, I don't know a huge amount about him, but his stats look good. Anthony Patterson at Sunderland. I think I think you need to be sort of casting a wide net on this one because bear in mind that whatever you sell Ramsdale for, twenty seven million of that, and yeah, 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 counting all that, twenty seven million of that goes to Raya. Yeah, goes for the Raya fee. Um, so you're probably going to have, like, just from a, I mean, I know it doesn't actually work like this in accountancy terms, but you're probably going to have less than 15 million at best to play with to get this substitute, the second goalkeeper. I think the, the level that City have with Ortega, where he's probably a step down, well, he is a step down from Edison, probably just about a starting Premier League goalkeeper that's kind of where you need to look at. So I would be looking in the championship, seeing if there's anyone good as well available on the free transfer. That's what you've got to do really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I have no, I have no names to play with on it. I have to say. Um, but yeah, I agree I, in terms of that sort of difference in quality. It's, it's going to be an important one to get right because you don't want to, you know, Arsenal made some poor decisions when it comes to goalkeepers fairly recently. And then you're left scrambling around trying to correct a mistake and you don't want to be doing that again. So made a profit um, on Matt Turner though. He did and make that's a good on that turn. That is a uh, that was a good bit of good bit of this business. Um, I didn't mind Turner at Arsenal. I had to say I didn't. I, I wasn't. He, I, he's obviously not a great goalkeeper, but I wasn't. Yeah, as you a number... clearly you've already forgotten those moments where Ramsdale would sort of go down needing treatment, and everyone in the Emirates would see Matt Turner walking, yeah, that is uh, warming up and going. That is oh true. You God. do, yeah. You want you want the second choice to be better than Turner, and you certainly want him to be. Um, better with his feet than Matt Turner, yeah. considering the way you play football. So you need to get the decision right, and hopefully they they go down a better route than him and Runnison before him. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so fingers crossed on that one. Anyway, look, we're up to about forty five minutes. I think that is a good time to wrap this up. Like I said at the start of this, everyone, I'm this is going out on Tuesday uh, morning, sort of mid morning. I'm going to be in the air on my way to Porto. Press conference is at seven thirty, or scheduled to be at seven thirty. Um, James is well aware 
uh, these trips tend to run late, so <laughs> it's probably going to start later than that. I imagine we show it on Wednesday. Yeah, um, and I will try and do a video afterwards of, from the press conference discussing what Mikel Arteta had to say. If not, I'll certainly be putting one out on Wednesday morning of the day of the game. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Until then, everyone, have a very good day. James, enjoy the week, mate. Thank you very much for your time, as always. And, um, and yeah, I'll see, see you on you. Saturday. Are you, go, are you going Saturday, yeah? I'll be there Saturday. Perfect. I shall see oh, you. Oh, remember, watch the Champions League on Paramount Plus if you're in the US. There we go. There you go. You got your nice plug in. Got your nice plug in. Take it easy, mate. Speak to you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye.